It is another episode of Getting to Know Seahawks Twitter. And on this week's episode, we are joined by a man who has an unhealthy obsession with a kid's restaurant that I think doesn't exist anymore. His name is Michael B. Jargon. We call him the Velvet Mike Man on social media. <laughs> this is a guy who has been writing and hosting with our guy, John David Fraley at Beast Pode, worked for Field Goals back in the day. Michael, what's going on, buddy? Not a whole lot, you know. It is the end of April. Tomorrow is uh, night one of the NFL draft. And I have uh, not followed along at all over the last several months. So I'm excited to, you know, drop some very set in stone cemented takes that are absolutely unequivocally correct. You know, like that's just that's just what we do. I heard that we are in for some spicy takes and, and, and we can get to them. <laughs> I want to give you credit because Seahawks Twitter is a different place. I think sure. a lot of people remain active on it throughout. And I think for a lot of people, after the way that this past season ended, specifically losing to first John Walford, then Jared Goff with <laughs> no thumb, was pretty difficult, even for me. I mean, I wore ram horns for a week because I dismissed the Rams Ooh. so much over the course of the buildup to that game. That that stunk. You have made the decision to, comparatively to some of the other folks on Seahawks Twitter, unplug yourself. I bow yeah. down to you, sir. That is probably the healthy approach this offseason. Yeah, you know, I... Uh... I think, oh, that's right. I'm not allowed to cuss. I think that there is no question that the last year plus has been exceptionally difficult for a lot of people and uh, in a lot of different and a lot of different areas. Not just know? in sports. Um, not just in sports. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's been a lot of other stuff going on. And um, obviously, I, I'm, I'm exceptionally thankful that, um, you know, the pandemic and, uh, and, and other, other stuff when I, I don't want to brush over the killing of George Floyd, but you know, like that sort yeah. of thing, like I I'll never understand that. Like, um, like people of color, you know? And so, Gosh. but I mean, with that, with that in mind, like it hasn't been an easy year, you know, but no. I, I think that, uh, you know, taking care of your mentals as Marshawn Lynch once <laughs> said is a, a very valuable thing to do. And, you know, uh, Twitter can be a bit of an echo chamber at times, and uh, it really feels like you're not getting anywhere in a lot of conversations. Yeah, um, even, even though uh, Twitter is great in a lot of facets, you know. So I, I, it's definitely not permanent. I'll be back on at some point, but figured uh, figured it'd be a perfect time for a little hiatus. And also, thanks for the reminder because I had somehow wiped the John Wolford uh, yeah. Jared Goff mess yeah. from my from my memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Well, I mean, here we are, and the Seahawks don't have a first-round pick or a third-round pick, and the guy that they traded, the first-round pick, and the third-round pick for Jamal Adams was not 100% in that game, so hopefully next season, should that game happen once again, and it's Matt Stafford at the helm, Jamal Adams can provide more of an impact, but yeah, that game was the absolute worst, so let's just talk about, oh, the other worst part about this offseason because we have spent the last – three and a half months or so trying to figure out what the heck's going on between the Seattle Seahawks and Russell Wilson. The uh, good news, yes. I guess, is that Michael, we now have peace in our time because Pete Carroll and John Schneider on Wednesday spoke to the media and said a bunch of different things, including they knew what the truth was and that they weren't going to say the word because they knew the truth said truth was that he was never getting traded. You've experienced off season Russell Wilson before, and perhaps I needed to talk to you or somebody else as far as how to handle the ups and the many downs of a period in time where Russell Wilson is speaking through his agent and perhaps mm. sharing his feelings on the current state of the team. Sure. You know, this, this actually kind of perfectly ties into the hot takes uh, oh. that I have, because this is actually, this is not one that I had written down, but one that was just organically formed a mid conversation. Look at us being all candid and stuff. Uh, no, the, um, I, I think that 
this may seem off topic, but it is related. The fact that the Seahawks fired Brian Schottenheimer is the worst possible thing they could have done this off season. And let me tell you why oh. Paul. it's because Russell Wilson has no accountability. He has no accountability and he needs, he needs the tutelage of one Brian Schottenheimer yet again. And I say that, partially in jest, but I, I really do think that like the whole drama after Russell Wilson was sitting in the, the suite watching Patrick Mahomes get absolutely eaten alive by JPP and Shaq Barrett and Devin white and Levante David and uh, seven other swarming Buccaneers. Um, I mean, the, the response to all that, I mean, it wasn't a good look, was it? It was, it was kind of just like, Ooh, yeah, that kind of happens to me too. So let's just kind of deflect. And I mean, obviously, I, I don't think that it's a stretch to say that the offensive line has been a problem in Seattle for no a doubt. long time. But let's not let's not get it twisted. Russell Wilson plays a part in that too. So Russell Wilson is great. He's the greatest quarterback this franchise has ever seen, and it's absolutely awesome that he'll continue to be a Seahawk. But um, yeah, I mean, he's kind of, kind of a goofball. It's interesting that you mentioned that the Brian Schottenheimer change and. So we finally actually heard from Pete Carroll on that front, too. I remember that Monday at the end of the season, we had Pete Carroll on for our weekly show. And I asked him, hey, uh, so what's the what's the future at offensive coordinator? And he said, Brian's going to be here. And then they have the press conference later in the afternoon. And then you find out at night, OK, the Brian Schottenheimer era is over. And they said it was a mutual parting of ways. Well, when pressed on, hey, what was the difference in philosophy today, Pete essentially said that he wasn't going to get into the details, but he made it sound as if it was not necessarily a mutual decision as perhaps Seahawks, this actual official Seahawks Twitter account put out there. So yeah. Shane Waldron's the new offensive coordinator, and we know that he's got a background with the Rams, and we know that he's got a background with the New England Patriots from way, way back in the day, and background yeah. at a random small uh, New England prep school that I used to be very familiar with. <laughs> I guess that's where so you got. So you got the inside scoop. Oh, yeah. You're BB like the and N. ticket in Seattle, uh, the Seattle journalism scene. You've got it on lock. Well, really crazily, uh, Mike Salk actually went to the same school that Shane Waldron coached at for oh. just a well, little bit screwed. of time. You're yes, screwed. I know. He's got a little bit more of the inside scoop than I do, but there's a new offensive coordinator, don't you think that this offensive coordinator is going to do a better job than Brian Schottenheimer? I mean, Brian Schottenheimer, I think, was pretty underappreciated in his time in Seattle. I feel like every offensive coordinator okay. will be underappreciated in Seattle because, like, in, in the pursuit of perfection, there can be no happiness, right? Like, over when Daryl Bevel was in Seattle, he was churning out the best offenses in franchise history. And do we look back favorably on Daryl Bevel? Maybe. You know, Russ like, seems I, I mean, to. he, yeah, I mean, like he, he obviously had his flaws as well. I'm not saying any of these guys are perfect, but like Brian Schottenheimer was like a fine play caller. And I, I think that like, it should not be overstated that Russell Wilson would just kind of broke the second half of last year. I don't expect that to necessarily continue. I think that Shane Waldron will be by all accounts uh, with the caveat that I haven't watched any tape of his. Uh, I think he'll probably be a fine offensive coordinator. Like just because it's not Lincoln Riley, it'll be fine. You know, like Russell Wilson is going to put up like 4,500 yards, 35 touchdowns, nine picks. It'll be fine. You know, I feel that it should this is, be This is real analysis, by the way. This I is like the hard hitting, the hard hitting source citing analysis that boo, you're looking for. Boo, boo, boo. Well, yeah. And I, I think right now it's all speculation when it comes to what Waldron's going to be able to do. Part of me is just hopeful. Uh, I guess to quote uh, the wise philosophers, go West, uh, to be the king of wishful thinking is really all you can do here and hope that. Shane Waldron is going to actually get more out of Russ than Brian Schottenheimer did. And, you know, it, the, the Brian Schottenheimer experience is interesting. A fine play caller, I think, is a, is a good way to describe him. I don't think he was catastrophic by any means. I remember when I first started covering the Seahawks on a daily basis in 2019, thinking to myself midway through the year, wait a second, do I think Brian Schottenheimer is good at offensive coordinating? And then the beginning of last year happened, and I was like, oh, is he going to get a head coaching job somewhere? And then the end of the last season happened, and I was like, all right, uh, bye. <laughs> and the ups and downs that you go along the way with that, I felt that there were times where they just were entirely predictable. Take a look at that pick six screen in the 
playoffs that they had against the Rams. And uh, also just seemingly an inability to beat cover two. And I'm not going to act like I'm some film, some film savant or anything like that. But at least per the internet people, <laughs> the Seahawks were going up against the same defense over and over and over again. And for whatever reason, Brian Schottenheimer couldn't beat it. So I would hope that somebody else can do that at the very least. And hopefully there's no other defense that then all of a sudden rises from the murky depths like Godzilla and uh, lasers uh, Russell Wilson in this offense into a complete stall like this just happened this past season. I mean, I think that it's pretty hard to move the ball on a defense that has just an absolutely astronomical star at both the front four and Aaron Donald in the secondary and Darius Williams, you know, like he's obviously yeah, he's really the good. cornerstone that they've built that defense. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> he's actually really well, good. Like, like Darius Williams played out of his freaking mind against the Seahawks. Last yeah. Year. Like, I mean, he, he's an awesome player, but like, Holy hell. Yeah, that pick six was probably the coolest play from any Seahawks game last year. Like objectively, it was unbelievable. It, that's like, that's like teaching tape for like, like how you would want to teach like DBs to play screens, you know? And it's like, Oh, why don't you do that every time? And Darius Williams just like did it. And it made it look pretty effortless too. So like, I mean, you, you can kind of get hung up on it. Like Schottenheimer couldn't solve the Brandon Staley Rams defense, but like his quarterback wasn't really was like a husk of his former self for a lot of that time also. So that's like not to, say that shoddy was a world beater, but like, it was fine. There were if you go back and watch, like there were obviously the offensive line was an issue. The pressure was an issue, but like there were, there were open guys streaking through the secondary in, in certain points. And it's just like, couldn't get the ball out and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, the moral of the story is that the Rams are awful and we should do everything we can in our power to destroy them. Yes. Gosh. Oh, I Los Angeles team too. It's uh, it's annoying. I, I don't think Matt Stafford's going to make them that much better, but uh, who am I to decide what happens there? So <laughs> the Seahawks now they move into the future, and Gabe Jackson is who they hope on the offensive line is going to be able to combat Aaron Donald on that Rams defense. They bring in Gerald Everett away from the Los Angeles Rams. They bring back Chris Carson. They bring back Carlos Dunlap. Uh, other moves that they decided to make, Benson Mayoa, they bring him back. Alden Smith, we'll see what the heck's going on with him. So you run through the moves. Nothing that they did this offseason really jumps out outside of maybe bringing Gabe Jackson back. They bring in a bunch of cornerbacks. We'll see if any of those guys are able to do anything you know it seems as if it's a traditional offseason for the Seahawks for you looking at this offseason and and I think maybe just having that fresh mindset because you haven't been focusing on Russell Wilson and the Seahawks the way that we have (laughs) yeah what are you most excited about for next season especially considering that during this draft over the next couple of days the Seahawks aren't going to make many picks at least early on uh well okay that I'll, I'll split that into multiple parts okay. because I consider the draft part of this coming season as well right and like last season it felt kind of weird you know because like starting up in empty stadiums with COVID this feels like you know the NFL is kind of starting back up again they're going to be fans in the stands again Um, but the draft, what I'm looking for, looking forward to in the draft is I'm, I'm looking forward to the Seahawks. They have three picks right now, right? Yes. Only three picks. I'm, I'm looking forward to them, uh, not trading down. In fact, trading up, uh, for another box safety. Um, it's not a need, (laughs) but you can never have too many of them. I'm excited for them to ignore, um, the offensive tackle, uh, need because it's Dwayne Brown, Brandon shell. And then what's the plan? There, there's Cedric of Weehy, of course. Yes. yes. So let's uh, let's reach out to our good <laughs> friends from Cincinnati and get their thoughts on Mister Mister Uh No, I I'm uh, I think the funniest thing about this draft uh, and how the Seahawks are involved in it is every single year, every freaking year, uh, the draft pundits, the draft Knicks, they mock a cornerback to the Seahawks in the first round. And if there was ever a year for them to draft a corner in the first round, it I mean, based on need, of course, um, it's this one, like you lose Shaquille Griffin to free agency. Quentin Dunbar is gone. Is Trey flowers, your best corner right now. Not great, but they don't have a first round pick, which is hilarious because this would be the year where you would look at those, those mock drafts and say, okay, well maybe, you know, like maybe 
the eighth time they'll get it right. But like, it would actually potentially be a possibility this year, but no, it, it's gone. But um, I, I do think that despite all this, the Seahawks should draft the running back first because positional value is <laughs> yes. important, and that is what we should be judging everything off. <laughs> you are so sarcastic, and I love it. And I'm wondering, as far as the overall draft experience, last, last year was weird even for the draft. I mean, we were supposed to be traded before the old COVID thing hit to yes. – the draft taking place in the Bellagio Fountain in Las Vegas. There were going to be barges that were going to transport players from the side for every single pick over to Roger Goodell. So that could have been hilarious. And then the inevitable, either the Seahawks decide to trade back and out of the first round move that they would probably make would have been, yeah, fun because I think a lot of people would be disappointed that there would be no Seahawk player going up there. But last year was weird, I would just say, as far as the overall draft experience. This is going to be the second time that I'm here for a Seattle Seahawks draft. How do I fit in? Do I just assume that there is going to be a drafting of a running back, that there will be no offensive lineman taken what should I expect just based off of the history and stereotypes and generalizations about the way that the Seahawks go about things? You should not pay attention to any prospects leading up to the draft whatsoever. <laughs> go in with a complete blank slate. And then whenever the Seahawks actually, I mean, you, you see their name on the little ticker at the bottom of the screen quite a bit, but you know, it keeps moving back, moving back, moving back. You know, I mean, patience is a virtue where, where the, Pete and John, they, they have a way of um, reminding us of that. But whenever a name pops up on the screen, you're not going to know who it is. Okay. I'm just telling you that now you're not going to know who it is because it's not just because you're going in with, with a blank slate in your mind, but just because it's, it's not who you want, but what you're going to do immediately following that pick being made is you're going to go to youtube.com and you're going to type in that player's name and you're going to watch the three minute and 27 second video, the highlights, and you're going to formulate your staunch opinion based off of that YouTube highlight video. And you're going to tweet about it and you're not going to stop tweeting about it. That's what you're going to do. That's how you approach Seahawks draft day. You're welcome. I'm really looking forward to the inevitable, man, Pete's out of touch, and John Schneider hasn't been able to draft in over half a decade takes that are, I know, coming, ironically, in a draft where they only have three picks. Yeah, kind of touching back on what I said before about not having the first round pick, how that's hilarious with the corner. I mean, it feels like this bit has probably been tweeted, but how many tweets have you seen like, oh, it's a good thing the Seahawks don't have a first round pick because they can't draft well in the first round. <laughs> probably like like 50 tweets out there already. Not enough. Yeah. Honestly, I might yeah, just type no that out right now and try to fit in mm -hmm. with everybody by pretending that I'm a part of this inside joke. You mentioned those cornerbacks too. I did see one. Michael Shunt Dugar has put up a bunch of stuff for The Athletic and there's a guy that plays for my alma mater and I can't even pronounce his name and I and he's a, I, I kind of hope that the Seahawks draft him but he's a cornerback. His name is Ifiatu Melifonwu. Oh, Melifonwu. Is that Obi Melifonwu's brother? Uh, sure. I, I should know that too. Don't, shouldn't I? Well, I, it is. I, I, I believe it is. Well, yes, it is. Guess what? Yeah. I, I'm so o on top of the Fano. NFL. <laughs> I'll give you a fun little history lesson here because this was, oh, this was 2015. We're not talking about Obi-Wan. Gotcha. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah. We're talking about his older brother. I mean, obi Melifon who was the spark God, Zach Whitman, uh, three Sigma athlete.com. Um, he, they're like, I, there was like five or whatever, four sigmas, four standard deviations about like the average NFL athleticism at their pos position. And this guy was a safety, right? Obi. And he was like one of the very few four Sigma athletes coming into the league. So everyone was like, Oh my God, who are the Seahawks going to take? And they didn't draft him. And then he ended up sucking, which is like, obviously like not, he, he wasn't like a highly touted prospect aside from his athleticism and like the other three Sigma or the four Sigma athletes in the league. What was it? JJ Watt, Lane Johnson. Um, I mean, it's a pretty good, pretty good track record for the four Sigma athletes. But yeah, his older brother kind of flamed out, even though he had godly athleticism. Well, of course, the Raiders drafted him, and then, yes, and then it didn't work, and then the Patriots tried it out, and then that didn't work, and yeah, that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. Ten combined tackles over the course of his career. So yeah, I'm hoping that his uh, younger brother is a little bit better, just because he went to Syracuse and not a terrible school like UConn. So uh, the, the draft, as it as, as we go through it, okay, I, I, I know what to expect. What do you expect out of Jamal Adams next season? 
And that's the other topic of conversation now that it mm. seems at least the Seahawks believe that we have peace in our time between the team and, and Russell Wilson. You trade a first, a third, and, and next year's first for him. He's likely going to get a massive contract extension. John Schneider intimated that they are going to give him that big deal. I liked, for the most part, what he did last season, but I also realized there are some limitations as far as what he brings to the table. He's a great blitzer. I, I would like the Seahawks to be a little bit less predictable with the way that they blitz him or maybe Adams to have a better um, poker face when it comes to those blitzes. I think he's great in pursuit of guys. We saw all those plays where he would bolt through the line of scrimmage and chase guys down on the other side of the field, whether it was uh, that running back on the Rams in week 16 or it was the uh, Cam Newton uh, in the second game of the season. Oh, but yeah. In coverage, we also have some, you know, fairly shaky moments as well, whether it was Julian Edelman in that very same game against Cam Newton or it was um, against uh, Stefan Diggs, that one isolated moment where he just got absolutely shook out of his shoes. Yeah, there was just yeah, you know, the one. Yeah, I remember that. He's, he's not a traditional safety. So so how do you feel about him, his first season with the team? And, and what are you expecting out of him next year? I think that this serves as an excellent reminder that I forgot to fully answer your question earlier about what I'm most excited to uh -huh. watch, um, uh, regarding the Seahawks in 2021. And I think that watching a uh, hopefully fully healthy Jamal Adams is like at the absolute top of that list. I mean, I, I think that it was pretty clear in week one, it, let's just look at that as an isolated moment, right? Week one after that win, I mean, obviously you're on top of the world because what, they win like 36 to like 17 or something. I don't yeah. know. Um, they, they, they clocked the Falcons and their offense looked unstoppable. They scored a like 40 yard touchdown on fourth and five. You're looking at Pete's um, nether regions uh, <laughs> once again. Um, I don't know. It, it, it was just like a very uh, exciting first game of the season and Jamal Adams was like absolutely at the top of everyone's excitement. He was like, he's great flying around, making he, what do you have? Like one sack, two sacks, but like he just breakups, like big tackles on third down. And um, since there was no crowd noise, you could basically hear everything that he was saying. On and the you field. could just hear him screaming about it. Yeah. He's just like a different type of human being in the coolest way, like an absolute alpha of alphas. I, and like, I can totally understand, like he got a lot of flack online last year. I can see like how, you look at him and see he's corny, like maybe a little bit, but like, that's just who he is. And he's just a sick player. And it's just like, so perfectly in tune with how Pete Carroll wants to play defense and coach his defense. And like, I mean, a whole different conversation is like whether you have the personnel at this point to actually run that defense, especially on the outside, because that was one of the biggest issues. And like in that Buffalo game last year, like they were just playing so scared about their cornerback depth that it's just, yeah. But they gave up like 45 points or whatever. Like it was, it was really bad. But anyways, if Jamal Adams is healthy, I'm very, very excited to see how the Seahawks deploy him because I'll, I'll um, the, the way that they blitzed him last year, uh, it didn't feel like it was just, Oh, well, let's just blitz Jamal Adams again. It, they were pretty tactical about it. I think Ken Norton jr. Did a pretty good job about that. Um, Obviously, there were some other gripes with his performance, but <laughs> he got I mean, better as the season went along, you know, and I gave him a definite flag. improvement. It, it was an uphill trajectory. We'll, we'll put it at that. But I, I, I'm super excited to watch Jamal Adams play. I, I don't see. Oh, actually, I don't want to jinx it, but my hope Here's is that if he's fully healthy, um, he'll show some more chops and coverage, you know, like won't just be purely a box safety. And I think that he has the athleticism and the drive to do that. I mean, keep in mind, when did they trade for him? Like what month last year did they trade for him? Uh, late July. It was late July. Okay. And then you have, there were no OTAs, right? Right. No. Was there training camp? There was no preseason. There was no a training, training camp, but there, there was, was, a was no camp. preseason. That's for sure. It was super bare bones, very weird off season. And so, I'm looking forward, obviously this offseason is on standard as well. I'm looking forward to seeing Jamal Adams hopefully healthy and hopefully having a full offseason to prepare for his role in the Seahawks defense. He understands that it is better. the and longest, most roundabout way possible for me to answer that question for you. You're welcome. I appreciate it. And they would understand him better. So I, I, I think that that definitely leaves the possibility open for him to be better 
this coming season. There's a couple of things that have nothing to do really with the Seahawks specifically that I want to get to. But since the draft is this weekend and we're probably not going to have some extremely memorable uh, moments like something that Michael Sean Tukar tweeted out um, earlier today. I think it was a video of the Seahawks drafting Jermaine Ifedi in the first round and commentators oh, yeah. talking about how Tom Cable's such a good offensive line coach, which I'm sure no one wants to hear that all these years later. But what was just sitting back and watching the draft? And it would be funny if you ended up wrong about one of these, but what's the most excited that you were for any specific pitch, uh, excuse me, pick while watching the draft. And what was the angriest that you got while watching the draft? Angriest was probably, I feel like Rashad Penny's too easy of an answer. Um, Fresh on the mind still. And honestly, yeah, I mean like not looking so good. It, right it, now. Was, it was a bad pick. I like he's a, when he was healthy, I mean, he was a good player and like, that's fine. But like, it's a bad pick. He had that he game had against the Eagles, but yeah, now the, the injury, it, it's... and He's had multiple games where he's looked awesome. Like right. 20, 2019, before he got hurt, that Minnesota game, oh man, he looked awesome. And uh, he was a certified Ram killer too. That man. is true. He, he's was, he was great. Made Evan, uh, Evan chicken out on Bleacher Report for uh, tattooing his face on his nipples. Oh. For over 100 yards. Oh no. Yeah, Rashad Penny was an ally in the cause of um, crapping on Evan online. He was an ally in that pursuit. So like that works, but I mean, okay. I, I do remember being pretty pissed off about the Jermaine Effetti pick as well, because that was like, it was like, it was like Cedric Ogbuehi, right? It's those freaking Texas A&M OTs. Right. And like the track record has been, it, it, obviously it's like, it's like, Ohio state quarterbacks, Justin Fields, not everyone is the same. Um, but that was like the sort of meme player that people were saying, God, if they draft Jermaine Fetty, it's just going to be a disaster. The and I remember people really, cause like miles Jack was sliding because of his medical concerns. Um, and like local kid and name more iconic duo than Seahawks Twitter and caping for local players to be signed <laughs> immediately or drafted immediately. But like that's, I mean, that's, that's fine. Um, yeah. Jermaine Effetti was pretty bad. It was that, that <laughs> I, I was pretty distressed about that. I remember just laughing. I, it was just like, of course they, of course they made this pick because it was just like, yeah, like an, like an offensive lineman late first round with not the best tape. Eh, we'll put him in the right guard. See what happens. <laughs> Everything went uphill from there again, right? Yeah, it was fine. Oh, it, was it was a great four-year tenure. Yeah, man. I mean, and now he's a guard elsewhere, and, and he's found his true calling with the, yeah, it's the Chicago Bears that bring him in too. So that's not not really well, a good sign either. <laughs> after the I'm fact. sure that I'm sure that his uptick in play is because he's finally playing for a quarterback that it's possible oh, yeah. to pass block for you know right and now that he's playing with um andy dalton the quarterback that john schneider wanted in seattle um <laughs> then yeah i mean I, I i don't see how this can't go awry what was the most excited you got for a pick then oh most excited i got for a pick i really i remember being hyped by the earl thomas pick um but i was I wasn't as like obsessive as I got in the years following. Um, so I would say the most <laughs> actually, no, no, no. I have, I have a better answer for the one. My most dejected, Dude. I was most dejected when the T the Seahawks drafted Tyler Lockett. Oh. They drafted Tyler Lockett, which has what? nothing to do with Tyler Lockett's um, uh, like, like the benefits of drafting Tyler Lockett. It was because I just ignorantly, I was a slave to the size. I wanted Jalen strong so badly. I mentioned him earlier because that's like my, <sighs> like my touchstone moment from the 2015 draft. Oh, also Frank Clark. That was kind of an infuriating pick because. So all the picks have been pretty terrible. Bad record as a person. It, but oh, like, yes, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like Tyler, Lockett, I just really wanted Jalen strong. And so yeah, Tyler well, Lockett was kind of distressing, but the most excited um, recently, I really, <sighs> Oh God, man. You're so negative. I liked, <laughs> I liked the, I liked the Cody Parkinson pick a lot. Okay. I, I don't think that, 
I you like tall guys, guys, clearly. I mean, because we, we yeah. were talking before the show, and, and, and you brought up a name that, honestly, I had to, I had to look up. Tanner McAvoy. Ah, six foot six wide receiver out of Wisconsin. That that I, yeah. I feel like you just like the tall. No, no, no. no, see the thing is, you've mischaracterized his position. Okay, he's a six foot six Swiss Army knife. From <laughs> what? So I, I have a different experience with that entire Tyler Lockett and Jalen Strong situation. I was in the Houston Texans stadium for the draft because I used to cover that team, and I remember seeing Tyler Lockett on the board. Lockett was one of like five or six players that I had watched enough of to really like. And I was like, please, Texans, get him. Please get him. And they sat there and they wanted him. They wanted him badly. I remember I remember the Texans wanted him so bad. And they were and the Seahawks jumped uh, out. And they drafted Jalen Strong. Yes, that wasn't a... Jalen Strong was a bad experience. That was not, yeah. uh, not a good time for the uh, Houston Texans, but uh, what has been a good time for the Houston That's Texans okay. of late. Yeah. It's yeah. okay because the Arizona State wide receiver pipeline has helped out your paths pretty well recently oh my as God. well stop stop <laughs> just now you're just, now you're just being mean <laughs> okay uh so I, I i saw this and i didn't really think that much of it but there's a part of me that agrees with speaking of patriots uh my perhaps father allegedly and uh god uh although i'm not sure i'm allowed to say that uh tom brady um he had a very, very strong take against the thing that the NFL is changing. And they are ah, yes. they are now allowing wide receivers and cornerbacks and running backs and linebackers and defensive backs to wear essentially whatever number they want, whether it's 1 through 19 or 2 through 49 or, of course, in the 80s as well. Not going to lie, there's only one part about it that I like that's not actually taking place. I want to see quarterbacks wear numbers that are double-digit again, like not just in, from 10 through 19. I want to see a quarterback wearing like 61 again or something just oh, ridiculous. You, you are just a disgusting human being. Well, Why would you say that? Because it's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Remember Otto Graham? No. Sammy Ball, number 33. Otto Graham, number 63. I, 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 there's a, a Doug Flutie in college. I think he was 20 or 22. I, I, oh. For some reason, that's the one number that I kind of get amused by when I see it's different for a quarterback. But... I don't really that like is. it for anybody that's not a quarterback. You know, like a, a wide receiver wearing number one. And I think this is because I grew up watching the NFL first and college football second. And I was always annoyed that there were a bunch of players that were in like the single digits because I was like, that's that's not what you're supposed to be wearing, fella. You should be wearing yeah. a number that corresponds to your respective position. Yeah. So I was not expecting uh the quarterback numbers to be the direction that you went with the one part of the rule that you liked. Um, and it's not even, and they're not even changing that part. That's the part I want them to exactly, change. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, the thing that I am. Yeah. I have some thoughts about this rule. Shoot. The thing um, that I am okay with funny enough is allowing single digit numbers to skill position players or uh, like defenders. But I think there should be a stipulation that you have to be super nice to be able to wear those numbers. Super nice. Expand. Like, I don't want, I don't want like, Oh geez. Um, what's his name? The freaking. let's just say I didn't, when, when Tedrick Thompson was in Seattle, I wouldn't want Tedrick Thompson wearing like three or like one or something like he wasn't good enough to wear those numbers. So you have to be, you have to have a certain like threshold of skill and talent to have those numbers. Okay. Like Patrick Peterson going to Minnesota. I haven't, I obviously haven't been very online, but I saw that Patrick Peterson is wearing number seven, seven in Minnesota, Minnesota like because that's like a mythical number in LSU. Like he wore it. Matthew wore it. Delpit wore it. Like a bunch of other DBs were there. But, um, I think that the, the single digit is fine. I think that all of pretty much all of the other rules along with it are absolutely egregious. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Running backs, tight ends, fullbacks, H backs, and wide receivers to wear one through 49 and 80 to 89. Ty Montgomery has gotten away with murder. Okay. He has normalized running backs in the eighties yeah. and I'm not okay. It's really with it. cool. I liked it. Secondly, the worst thing I thought that linebackers in the forties was bad. Freaking wide receivers in the forties. I'm disgusted. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. You're talking to a ex high school wide receiver who is number 42 because someone stole 45 and he would have been 45. Oh, God. 
I know. This is I'm oh, evil, aren't I? <laughs> Defensive lineman, 50 to 79 is fine. 90 to 99, obviously, they already worked. Okay, everything remained. DBs from 1 to 49. I don't like DBs 10 to 19. I don't know why. Okay, so you only want the single-digit numbers. I can get behind that line of thinking. I, I remember at, at Florida, generally the fastest guy on the team, whether on offense and defense, and sometimes you had a guy on offense and defense with the same number. They would wear number one. I don't know if there's any ex, uh, special significance behind it, but I remember it was Kiwan Ratliff who was wearing number one for a while, and Percy Harvin, who was eight for a bit, he ended up changing to number one as well. I liked him better when he was number eight, personally. But... Ooh. I love the I love the Percy Harvin callback. I have one of those in my hot takes, so that's very nice. Okay, very nice. Um, the other part of that rule, the other part of that rule that I thought was um, passed, but I guess not. I, I guess I saw a um, source in dispute, but I thought that <laughs> linebackers would have been allowed to wear numbers in the thirties, and I was not here for that. Linebackers in the thirties, you don't like it. No, I mean, I guess if it's like a like like Cam or like Jamal type player, like box safety, like they're like a sub linebacker. Eh, I don't know. I just don't like it. I don't, I don't have to explain myself. Tom Stop Brady doesn't like it. Questions. I, listen, I, Tom, yeah, exactly. That's, that's right. He he tweeted about it. Put on his Insta story or something. The, right. The reason that he's upset about it, I actually think, is somewhat legitimate. But he's just going to have to deal with it. Is that. I think he, before a play, likes that he can just take a look at numbers and determine, oh, this guy's a linebacker. Oh, this guy's a defensive back. And now yep. you can muddy the waters to the point where if I'm an NFL team, I want to have all of my guys over the middle of the field, linebackers and safeties, wearing numbers that are all in the same range, like in the 30s, yep. in the 40s. Oh, there's definitely strategic yeah. merit to it. You could confuse a quarterback potentially. I mean, look, I, I, I think it's perhaps a little naive of us to think that every single player on every single team is going to be able to memorize who is who and who does what based off of their Jersey number going into the game. Like some, I think might have a really good memory and are able to say, Hey, this guy does this, this guy does that. And I'm sure that coaches are going to say, Hey, key in on this number, key in on that number for a bunch of different things in the prep leading up to a game. But I do think that there is an element of sometimes you just, you know, forget who's who. (laughs) And I I wonder what would take place in a game. I think that if you went into an NFL game where your quarterback and I'll just say even center, not even the entire offensive line, but the one who sets your protections, if you don't know if you have oh, those like, guys have no excuse, You're right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. We're on the same page. I'm wondering about like, yeah. the other guys, if, if, if they might get yeah. a little bit confused by it. Yeah, exactly. Wait a second. Is that a safety? Is that a linebacker? I can't tell. He's super jacked now, and he's about as fast as a safety. Uh, I don't know yeah. what's going on here. I guess it's fitting that as we're like moving to more like positionless football, that the numbers would move in tandem. But like, it's gross, <laughs> and I won't stand for it. <laughs> I know you have a slew of hot takes to get to. We're running out of time. But yes. What is the hottest take? that Michael B. Jargon has on his mind. That he I actually wants to... have three in the first two. I'll say super quickly okay. and because the first one has to do with Jersey numbers. The first okay. one is Richard Sherman looks better in a 49ers uniform than he did in the Seahawks uniform. Whoa. I think that's like, it's fact. Like there's, there, you can't argue that. Well, you're it's saying true. 49ers uniforms look better than Seahawks uniforms. If you're saying they do. that then. Yeah, okay. they do. Okay. They're, I, they're I agree. objectively better uniforms than the C, the current Seahawks uniforms. If we're talking the originals, oh, the Seahawks original uniforms. Bring them back. If you brought those into 2021, they're we're so hot. A whole different conversation. They're, they're so, so hot. beautiful. Bring those uniforms are beautiful. Right now, Seahawks uniforms are kind of mid. It just is what it is. But that's fine. The, like they're, whatever, they're not like egregious. They're better than the green uniforms the, that were in between the old school uniforms yes. and this one. But yes, and they are. they're the ones that are associated with you really winning now too. So it's one of those awkward moments where do you really want to change your look when this has been your look when you've been successful? And I feel like sometimes right. that is bad juju for your team going forward. Okay, hot take number two. Fire. This one will be super quick. The Seahawks would have beaten the New England Patriots in Super Bowl Forty Nine had they not traded Percy Harvin earlier that season. An alternative form of this take is that the Seahawks would have beaten the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 49 had C.J. Procise been born two years earlier. (laughs) Okay, let's extrapolate on the first one. What would Percy Harvin have done in Super Bowl 49 that 
the Patriots would not have had an answer for other than oh, being I, exceptionally fast. Oh, I'm not, I'm not here to dig into these in depth. <laughs> not, not, well, uh, what I was, I mean, he was obviously like an incredible offensive weapon. What was it like? Uh, he was traded after the Cowboys game, right? Yes. And the game before that was the, uh, uh Washington, uh, yeah, the Washington football team and their prior still day, weird to say, doesn't um, it? Where he scored, we had three touchdowns called back on penalties. So, like, I get the frustration, but like, also, I mean, throwing Golden Tate into a trash can is the funniest thing. I've ever had. So, like, <laughs> it's a great I'll, motivating I'll, tactic in a Super Bowl. <laughs> he's just, he's just another, he's just another weapon that you can stress the defense with. I didn't have anything specific other than that. But the final take, and this is the piece de resistance. Paul, are you ready? I am so okay. ready. Looking at both of their Seattle careers in totality, Marshawn Lynch has been more important to the Seahawks than Russell Wilson. Boom. <sighs> Let me explain why. I can hear buttholes puckering up across the Pacific Northwest. Let's think this through. Okay. Who plays a premium position? Now, quarterbacks are obviously valuable, but can you quantify heart? Running backs are getting drafted in the first round again. Can you properly value grit, Paul? I think the answer is resounding no. Next point. Who's responsible for the worst play in Seahawks franchise history? Ricardo it's Russell Wilson. It's oh. Russell Wilson. On the flip side, who's responsible for the greatest play in Seahawks history? Okay, it's Richard Sherman. But who's responsible for arguably the second greatest play in Seahawks history? It's Marshawn Lynch. Okay, beast quake. My final point. Final point. Point number three. You see my, my strategy? I'm just saying this fast enough to where you can't say anything. My final point <laughs> I'm fine with is, in the, is in the form of a question. Has Russell Wilson ever won a playoff game with Marshawn Lynch off of the roster? The answer is yes, one. And it happened to be the game where Thomas Rawls set a Seahawks playoff rushing record at 209 yards against Detroit. So what I'm getting at is this. Russell Wilson clearly cannot win in the postseason without a dynamic power back, hence why re-signing Chris Carson was a great move and why Marshawn Lynch has been more important to the Seahawks than Russell Wilson. You're welcome. I like it. That's pretty good. Here it is. Exactly. We, I don't think we need to dwell on that anymore. We started off in a weird place, but yeah, you came in for a landing. You bounced on the runway a little bit, but that is accurate. Are the Lions a real football team too? Does that even count if you beat the Detroit Lions in the playoffs, given their history? Yeah, I like I like that line of thinking there, and I do think it was very important that they bring Chris Carson back, especially with just the way that they play uh, every single season, which frustrates a lot of people. Last question for you, Michael. Sure. Describe Seahawks Twitter in one word. One word only. Um, ooh. I've, I've like seen videos that you posted on Twitter. Or like, I, I like even have watched through a couple of these on your channel. And like this question, I should have prepared this. I should have known. I should have thought ahead. It's the last one um, for everybody, but it's fine. One, one word. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think John did this exact same thing. I'm not going to use one word. I'm going to cop out, but I'm going to, I'm going to use an object to describe or like something to describe it. I would describe Seahawks Twitter as a perpetual motion machine. Okay. Where it's just like, kind of like the inertia of all of these conversations just keeps going and going and going. And we've been having the same damn conversations in 2021 that we were having in 2016, which is like fine. I mean, like obviously these narratives persist, but like, and this isn't always a bad thing, you know, like Seahawks Twitter has the pros and cons. Like I, I, I told you before this, I'm like immensely grateful for all the relationships that have, um, that I've made through Seahawks Twitter, you know? Um, but yeah, it can be taxing at times. Maybe taxing is the word. Taxing is a good one, especially seeing as you took a little vacation from it. And yeah, we definitely want you back on Twitter. Oh, the, I can't even say sh post on here. No, you said it now. <laughs> it's too late. It's no, too I late. Gotta bleep that out. I'm you so son sorry. of a biscuit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I don't, I've, uh, yeah, I haven't, um, I haven't created content in quite a while, but, um, I'm sure that will change at some point. Like the content but. is missed. May Chuck E. Cheese rise from the grave. Wait, am I am I correct in saying that our first uh <laughs> was it the reason that you followed me on Twitter was because during a Seahawks game, you were sitting in the press box next to Stacy Rost and I tweeted something. It was like that uh the duck with the red beak with like giving the really like weirdly sensual side eye. <laughs> And you like saw it in the press box and you're like, oh, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> Am I correct in saying that that was your first exposure to the 
the the velvet mic man if you will i'm not even that's sure like, i don't even call myself that by the way that's just like oh i want to call on, you that now play on a an old basketball coach's name i did want to ask you was, about why I think that her name was. was velvet milkman velvet milkman her name <laughs> let me see i'm pretty yeah uh she was the women's golf coach oh she's still there at murray state the 2020 to 2021 season will be her 28th at Murray State. Oh, okay. look at that! Shouts to Velvet uh, Milkman. <laughs> Velvet Milkman. Milkman. <laughs> Milkman. It has to be Milk. <laughs> you know, I honestly, I, I definitely remember the Chuck E. Cheese gifs. I don't remember oh, the yeah. duck one. So I'm, you're gonna, you're gonna have to send this to me off the air, and maybe I'll put a link to it whenever I post this bad boy up. Oh, yeah, I'll send it to you right now. I've got it on. I've got it on deck. Excellent, but, excellent. Um, yeah, Charlie. I mean, it's. I, I'm glad that you mentor, uh, mentioned uh, Charles Entertainment because we couldn't get through this whole thing uh, without without mentioning that iconic individual. Pour one out for that place, which, by the way, we didn't have R.I.P. One. I never went to one as a kid. I'm very disappointed. I don't think I've ever been to Chuck E. Cheese. I don't think I've ever been. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why I obsessively uh, post all these like videos and horrible, <laughs> awful, just <laughs> decrepit, debaucherous edits. How did they think that was because a good I never idea went. to attract children to this restaurant? Hey, here's a rat. It might kill you in your sleep. That's what it looks like. Or, or steal your identity, like best case scenario. Yeah. But I mean, hey, Charles Entertainment, he doesn't miss. No, so. he doesn't. <laughs> Michael, Anyways, thanks for having me on, man. This I really has been a blast. It. I appreciate you listening to my drivel for like forty-five minutes. Oh my god, you I, are patient. You I, are a patient individual. <laughs> I could do this all day. I, I I always enjoy this. I I enjoy you very much on Twitter, Michael. And uh, let's do this again, man. Absolutely. At Beast Pod, everybody, make sure you're following it. He and John David Fraley, those two are my guys. So you better be listening to them. So long, farewell to Luke. Okay, bye.